All right, so we're now ready to go to God's Word right now. So could we please rise from our seats at this time? Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the wonderful time of worship that we have had. Thank you so much for all the goodness that you have showered upon us. Every single day is a revelation of who you are. And we thank you, Lord, because we can say that every day is the day that you have made. And so we come before you once again, asking, Lord, that you bless us. Bless us with your word, O God. Bless us with understanding. Bless us, Lord, in such a way that we get convicted with the word and that we get to apply it after this service. Lord, I submit myself to you. I pray, Father, that you might make me your mouthpiece. Be with my mouth, O God. And speak in such a way, Lord, that people might know that you are speaking directly to them. So I ask the Holy Spirit to help me and guide me all throughout this sermon. And whatever is going to be achieved today, we will give you back the glory, the praises, and the thanks. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. Let's be seated in the presence of the Lord. I've entitled this uh, morning sermon, Remembering God's Goodness. Now, we will be taking a look at Esther chapter 9 and verses uh, 20 to 32. And you will observe that there are certain key phrases here. But I just like to focus on two, which we find actually in verse 28. The first phrase says, so these days were to be remembered. So the key word here is remembered. And then in the second part of that verse, it says, these days of Purim were not to fail among the Jews or their memory fade from their descendants. The key phrase here is, or their memory fade from their descendants. Now, these phrases tell us the theme of this particular passage and basically speaks about intentionally remembering God's goodness as well as His deliverances. Now, of course, in our study of the book of Esther, this deliverance came about as a result of a threat to that particular nation. And we know that Haman, the evil man, was desiring to annihilate that entire nation. Now, we find here that both Mordecai and Esther made certain steps to ensure that Israel's God moments would not be forgotten. Remembering God's goodness and deliverances is key to walking in faithfulness to God. Actually, this week and the other week, I was shocked to hear one of my heroes in the faith who has just apostatized. I'm talking about Joshua Harris, and I believe some of you uh, know him. Uh, that name rings a bell because he wrote some very uh, important books, books, in fact, that became bestsellers. You have uh, Kiss Dating Goodbye, then you have Dug Down Deep, and then you have uh, Stop Dating the Church. I think he wrote about uh, five books, and they were all bestsellers. But right now, he makes a profession, or he makes a confession that he is not a Christian. And his wife made the same confession that she is not a Christian. Now, there are some Christian sectors who have made a definitive statement that perhaps he is not a Christian. And I would not like to make that statement early on because I would like to believe that while he is still alive, there is still hope that he might come into repentance. And that is my prayer, really. My heart is saddened because I met him uh, when my family and I got to attend together for the gospel in Kentucky. So I got to meet up with him. I had a short chat with him. And so I asked him if he was willing to come to the Philippines. And he said, 
if my schedules would permit it, I would be, I would be willing to go. And so we exchanged some emails, and um, he was really willing to go, but sadly, his mother died. His mother, by the way, is Japanese. His father is an American. His mother is Japanese. And so his mother died as a result of cancer. And so I left it at that. But there was another opportunity presented to me by OMF when they said that he was coming here to Cebu. And so I said, I, I know him and I'd be glad to host him. Unfortunately, that didn't push through. And now I'm thinking that maybe it was really the wisdom of God because if he had come and you had been acquainted with him and known his teachings, probably you would stumble as a result of this event. Some of the things that he's writing in, um, in his posts, in his Instagram posts, are really things that would really shock you. Anyway, my point simply by sharing that is that one of the reasons why we stop walking in faithfulness is because we stop remembering the goodness of God. Our God is a good God. Our God is a faithful God. He has never deserted us. He has never left us. He has never abandoned us. To be sure, there are dark moments in our lives. There are seasons of cloudiness. There are seasons wherein we don't seem to see the light at the end of the tunnel. But then again, God warned us and told us in His Word that this is the reality that we face. It's part of the reality menu of this earthly life that we are living. And so we are not to be shocked when adversity takes place because really that's what the Lord said. But then again, if we count our blessings, we realize how faithful our God is and how He even brought us out of those places of darkness and planted our feet on the rock. He planted our feet on Himself. And because of that, we have found stability and security and safety. And so, friends, this topic that we're going to share this morning has to do about intentionally remembering the goodness of God. If you go to the book of Deuteronomy, which, by the way, is a book that we will be studying in our new course in Old Testament 101, you will find that one of the central themes, in, in fact, the biggest theme of that book, has to do with intentionally remembering the goodness of God. And the warning in the book of Deuteronomy is that if we stop remembering the goodness of God, then there is the possibility of drifting away from Him. Well, when we talk about the history of Israel, that's exactly what had happened to them. They had forgotten their God who was a covenant-keeping God. They had forgotten all the faithful and good deeds that God has done, the miracles that He had performed. And as such, they slowly drifted away until they entered into religious syncretism and then apostasy. God finally judged them with the Assyrian as well as the Babylonian exile. And so, sadly, this became part of the history of Israel. And as I reflect on that, obviously, that brings fear in my heart personally. And my prayer to God is, Lord, may I be found faithful all the way to the end. May I be able to say, just like Paul, I have fought the good fight. I have finished my course. I have finished my race. I pray that that would be true at the end of my days. And I pray that would be true as well at the end of your days. So allow me to just, before I introduce to you the outline, allow me to give you a little survey of the book of Deuteronomy so that you yourselves would be able to see through the verses of Scripture that I will present to you that this was something that was uh, truly a burden in the heart of God, a burden that He wanted to instill in the hearts of people to remain faithful to Him, that they would not forget who He was and what He had done. So let's have a look at some passages of Scripture. Let's take a look at Deuteronomy 
chapter 4, verse 9, first of all. It says, Only give heed to yourself and to keep your soul diligently so that you do not forget the things which your eyes have seen and they do not depart from your heart all the days of your life but make them known to your sons and your grandsons. Deuteronomy 4, 23. So watch yourselves that you do not forget the covenant of the Lord your God which He made with you and make for yourselves a graven image in the form of anything against which the Lord has commanded you. Deuteronomy 6, verse 12 says, Then watch yourself that you do not forget the Lord who brought you from the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery. Deuteronomy 8 verse 11, Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping His commandments and His ordinances and His statutes which I am commanding you today. Deuteronomy 8 verse 14, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out from the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery. Deuteronomy 8 verse 19, it shall come about if you ever forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them. I testify against you today that you will surely perish. Deuteronomy 9 verse 7 reads, Remember, do not forget how you provoked the Lord your God to wrath in the wilderness from the day you left the land of Egypt until you arrived at this place. You have been rebellious against the Lord. And finally, Deuteronomy 25 and verse 19 states, Therefore it shall come about when the Lord your God has given you rest from all your surrounding enemies in the land which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance to possess, you shall blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. You must not forget. So time and time again, as we go through the book of Deuteronomy, this is the central theme, do not forget. And I think it has to do with the fact that not only Israel, but we ourselves tend to be forgetful about the things that God has done in our lives. And so if you and I do not want to walk the path that Joshua Harris is walking right now, you and I need to be intentional about remembering all that God has done for us. And let me tell you, it's not easy work. It is hard work. If you go to the Lord's Prayer, we find the intention of God in the early part of the Lord's Prayer, wherein it says, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The first part of our prayer needs to be about hallowing the name of God, about thanking Him, praising Him. And by that, we begin to have grateful hearts, hearts that have great faith in this God whom we serve because He has done great and mighty deeds in our lives. Now, in today's study, we will see how Mordecai and Esther institutionalized the way by which God delivered them. And the passage flows in four natural parts, which I would like to show to you on the screen right now. So let me just back up right now. So first of all, we find in verses 20 to 23, steps to remember. These were actual steps that Esther and Mordecai allowed the people of Israel to go through. And I believe there are some practical applications here for us as well. And then in verse 24, they remembered the crisis that they went through. Again, that's something that we need to do and apply in our lives in verse 25, we find remembering God's deliverance. And finally, in verses 26 to 32, making permanent the remembrance. This is exactly what Esther and Mordecai did. Now, this sermon will teach us practical ways on how to remember God's goodness in our lives so that we would remain faithful. So let's jump right into verses 20 to 23. But first, let's read verse 20 as we take a look at steps to remember. So let's take a look at verse 20 at this time. It says, Then Mordecai recorded these events. 
And he sent letters to all the Jews who were in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, both near and far. Now, let's stop there first of all. It says Mordecai recorded these events. He did not want it to fade from their memories. So he chronicles it. And then he sends letters to all the Jews, citing how God had delivered them in a mighty way. Now, that's one good step to be able to remember the goodness of God. Now, in so far as we are concerned, probably one of the more practical things that we can do is to write a journal or a chronicle. Early on in my Christian life, most especially in my ministry here in Cebu, I started to write in my journal. I had a spiritual diary, and I began to recount the many things that God had done. So when God would, would do something spectacular, when there is a God moment in my life, I would definitely record it in my journal. However, as time went on, I became quite busy, and I began to forget about writing uh, posts on my journal. Until finally, Edmond Chan just reminded me how very important it is to have a journal. In his own words, he said, journals do not lie. Journals do not lie. And basically what he meant by that is that our journals are actually a reflection of our spiritual journey. And it's always good to be able to make reflections on how God has dealt with your soul. And right now, it's something that I am daily practicing. My wife is also daily practicing it as well. And it's really refreshing. There are times when you, you tend to think, how, how did God deal with me two days ago? Or how did God deal with me a week ago? And so you go back and read your journal, and then you remember, and you're refreshed. You're encouraged. You're inspired. And somehow, this is something that we need to be able to do. As I mentioned to you, remembering all that God has done is hard work. One of the things that the devil would like to do in our lives is to make us forget the good things that God has done. That is why several warnings were given by God in the book of Deuteronomy. And all we need to do is simply look at what had happened to the history of Israel, and you will see what forgetfulness will do to you. It will definitely hamper, hinder, destroy your spiritual life. Now, aside from this, we find in verse 21 that Mordecai obliged them, it says obliging them, to celebrate the 14th day of the month Adar and the 15th day of the same month annually. So, the practical thing that he did was to make obligatory celebrations annually in verse 21. Now, just a footnote, they did not celebrate it during the times they were fighting. But rather, they celebrated uh, these feasts during the times when they rested. In other words, after the victory. And of course, that's only logical that they would celebrate after the victory. But then again, here's something that perhaps you and I can do with our families trying to remember those good things that God has done. Now, of course, in our marriage relationship, how many of you, by the way, are married? Could you please raise your hands? Well, now, what is one of the things that we intentionally try to do? Well, one of the things we intentionally try to do is to remember our wedding anniversaries, right? Now, you know that if the men forget the anniversary, they're in deep trouble, right? So they just have to remember that. They just have to mark it on their calendars just to be sure that that day would be made special for both of you. So maybe you go to a uh, fancy restaurant, you have fine dining, or maybe you give a roast to your wife, maybe some chocolates, or maybe a love letter, Whatever it is, you want to make that day special. You intentionally remember it. And it's a good thing. You know that it helps your marriage. You know that it builds up your marriage. Now, if we could do that to a fellow human being, to our spouse, 
Why shouldn't we be intentional in doing that for our Lord? That is why the people of Israel, they would, they would have memorials in certain places. They would put memorial stones just to remember what God has done. And I think we need to be able to do that as well. In verse 22, it says, Because on those days, the Jews rid themselves of their enemies. And it was a month which was turned for them from sorrow into gladness and from mourning into a holiday. Now look at what Mordecai was doing here. He was not just remembering the deliverance of God in a generic way. But rather, he was reviewing for the nation of Israel the specific ways by which God had delivered them. And first of all, he speaks about ridding themselves of their enemies. And then he says, our sorrow was turned into gladness. And then he says, our mourning turned into a holiday. Now let me ask you this question. How did God rid you of your enemies? Were there times in your life when you had deep, deep sorrow? Maybe you were having a, a meltdown or you were going through a period of depression and God delivered you. God turned your sorrow into gladness. Do you remember those times? Do you remember the times when you were mourning because of a, a certain thing that had happened in your life? Maybe an injury, maybe a death, maybe a loss. Whatever the case might be, do you remember how God turned that moment around and it became sort of a holiday for you? I'm sure there are moments like that. And, and friends, it is spiritually healthy to be able to remember that. In so far as I am concerned, I do not forget those moments, those God moments that I have had in my life. Ever since we started ministry, my wife and I had always been living by faith. And we just want to thank God for the way He had provided us, uh, for us. Early on, I recall the time when we no longer had breakfast. We were still in Manila at that time. And I was conducting a Bible study. And so, I was wondering where we would have food for breakfast the following day. But then again, I just didn't mind it. I just trusted the Lord that when tomorrow comes, there would be food on the table. Interestingly, one of the couples I was doing a Bible study for, they left the Bible study, but then they came back. And when they came back, they gave us this, this huge brown envelope. And so I, was, I held on to it because it was given to us, and I was wondering, what's inside this? And later on, my wife and I opened it, and guess what was inside the brown envelope? Bacon. Now remember, what we needed was, was breakfast. Was that coincidence? I don't think so. I mean, the couple could have given us a whole piece of chicken, right? That wouldn't be nice for breakfast, right? But bacon would be good. But here's another problem. Uh, we did not have pandesal. We didn't have bread to go together with it. And so I said, Lord, this is so good. We're going to have bacon, but we don't have bread. But then again, God just reminded me, try to look on top of your refrigerator. And true enough, when I looked on top of the refrigerator, I saw a lot of coins. So praise God, we had bacon and pandesal. Praise be to God. Now that might be a small thing for you, but somebody who lives by faith, somebody who does not have a salary, that's a big thing. I recall the time also when we were, not, we were not going to have dinner. We didn't have any food. All of a sudden, we were in Labangon at that time. That was the first place that we lived in. All of a sudden, there was this sister riding a bike. And she was holding on to a, a, a plastic. And she carried with her a whole piece of chicken. We didn't have dinner, 
But then again, when the sister came, we had fried chicken. Amen? So again, it was dinner. Fried chicken is good for dinner. Again, for some of you, I don't know if you can relate to that or that's something special to you, but that was special to me. Because again, we were going to go hungry if nobody came over. God has been so good. I remember the time when I almost lost my son, five years old, and he had the highest strain of dengue. I remember that. And I thank God that, that his preaching behind this pulpit already, something that would not have happened if God did not spare him. I remember my, my wife's near-death experience. I would be a widow by this time. And so I remember those things. And I, I continually to bring it back to my memory because it reminds me of the goodness of my God. It reminds me of the way God delivers. It reminds me that our God is a God of love. He is a God of kindness. He is a God of compassion. That is who our God is. But oftentimes we do forget these things. Now notice also that as they turned, as the Jews turned their deliverance into a holiday, in the last part of verse 22, it reads that they should make them days of feasting and rejoicing and sending portions of food to one another and gifts to the poor. Now what was Mordecai doing here? Well, he was giving instructions on how to celebrate the occasion. And so there were four things that we find here. There was to be feasting. Number two, there was to be rejoicing. Number three, there was to be an exchanging of viands. All right? And then there were to be giving gifts to the poor. And I think this was really a wonderful thing to do when you're celebrating the goodness of God. Because what had happened here is that they were recipients of God's grace. They were recipients of the blessings of God. They were recipients of the deliverance of God. And as a result of that, because they were grateful to God, what they wanted to do was that they wanted to become dispensers of grace as well. And I think that's what needs to happen. We receive grace and we give grace to others as well. That's the best way to remember the goodness of our God. As the Bible says, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And that's what we need to intentionally do when God blesses us. We need to bless others as well. Not only that we might remember the goodness of God, but they too, the people we give to, might have the opportunity to give thanks and praise to God. Amen? Because as God has blessed us, we now we have blessed them. And guess what they're going to do? They're going to thank God. They're going to bless God. I believe that's a good thing to be able to do. Now, in Corinth, there was a feast that was supposed to be a, a time of showing care for one another in remembrance of what the Lord had done at the cross. It was called the love feast. And what they did was to celebrate the Lord's Supper, but in addition to that, they, they brought food, potluck. So each family brought food to one of the houses, and there they celebrated the Lord's Supper, and then they also had meals to be able to fellowship with one another. However, that love feast, the intention of that love feast became something that was the complete opposite. It became a hate feast. Because what had happened was the rich people would arrive early, they would be bringing their own viands, they would be bringing their own food, and they would now occupy the inner rooms, and they would devour, practically devour the food. So that by the time the poor people arrived, they arrived with very little or even no food at all. So many of them actually went home hungry. They were celebrating the Lord's Supper, which was a symbolic of the greatest love this world has ever experienced. And yet, in return, they were hating their own brethren. 
Now, I think that's a bad thing. And that's why, friends, we need to do these things intentionally as well. We need to be channels of blessing. We need to be conduits of blessing. That's one of the ways to remember how God has been good to us. And you know what? It always feels good to be a blessing to other people. When you see the smiles on their faces, when you see their, their, their eyes lighting up, do you know what, what that does to your heart? Do you know that that warms your heart, that brings joy into your heart, into your soul? To be able to see other people happy, blessed, and joyful. And again, this is one of the things we need to be able to do to remember the goodness of God in our lives. In verse 23, it says, Thus the Jews undertook what they had started to do in what Mordecai had written to them. So it was a spur-of-the-moment holiday right after the deliverance of God, but then it says here, they undertook what they had started to do. In other words, they were starting to institutionalize it. They were starting to make it a tradition. Now, some people think that tradition is a bad thing, most especially when we come from the background that you and I have come from. I mean, we're allergic to the word tradition. Well, let me just tell you this. There are certain traditions that are actually helpful. And this is one of the traditions that were actually helpful for the people of Israel. And what this tells us is one of the practical ways by which we can remember the goodness of God is to execute a plan of action. To execute a plan of action. Now, you can do it actually with your own families. Try to remember some days or some, some God moments that you have had. Mark them on your calendars. And when that day comes, when that day arrives, try celebrating it. It's a good thing. And isn't it true that the Lord has given us the ordinance of the Lord's Supper? Why do you think He gave that to us? That we might remember Him. That we might remember the sacrifice that He had done. That we might remember that He became our substitute. And that without Christ, there would be no salvation for us. So again, the success of remembering God's goodness depends on the execution of our plans. Now, in the second part, we find here remembering the crisis in verse 24. We also have to remember the pains that we went through. In this case, they remember this man of the evil one, the man of the devil, Haman. In verse 24, it reads, For Haman, the son of Hamedatha, the Agagite, the adversary of all the Jews. So they remember this foe. They remember this enemy. They remember the national threat. They remember the possibility of national extinction. They remembered what could have been. I try to remember what could have been if I lost my wife. She's been a tremendous helpmate to me. And I'm thinking right now, if, if God had taken her home at that time, then I would have no one to help me in ministry. Somebody who would come alongside. I remember that. I remember how, how my son, when, when, when he was gasping for breath, said, and he was only five years old, he said, I can't take this anymore. I remember that. And I, I remember that intentionally because right now, my son helps me. He helps me in my preaching duties. He helps me out with, with some of my responsibilities. He, he, he helps me out as, as my researcher in my books that I make. What a blessing that is. But sometimes we do forget. We, we forget the pains that we went through. We forget the moments when we were so desperate. And we were clinging on to God. I, I recall that funny story when, when there was this man who fell off a cliff and he cried out, God help me! And all of a sudden, there was this branch which, which caught him, which caught his, his clothes. And so he was saved and he said to God, never mind, Lord, I'm okay. Forgetting that, who knows? I mean, 
forgetting that that branch was put there by God to save his life. And many times, we now consider coincidence the many good things that have happened in our lives. No, friends, remember this. God is sovereign. He knows every minute and big detail in our lives. In fact, if you understand the sovereignty of God, you will never believe in coincidence. You will see life as a series of divine appointments by God. You will see them as the moving of God in your life. You will see the fingerprints of God in every narrative of your life. And that's what we need to do, to be aware and to be conscious of God. Herein lies our own spiritual lifeline. If we forget the goodness of God in our lives, we put our souls at risk. But if we remember Him continually, if His face, if the attributes of God are continually right before us, then we will walk in a holy manner. We will walk in a way that glorifies and honors God. That is how it simply is. This is how crucial remembering the goodness of God is. The people of Israel remembered in verse 24 how Haman had schemed against the Jews to destroy them and had cast pur, that is the lot, to disturb them and to destroy them. The three D's, I call them, to destroy, to disturb, to destroy. They remember that. Ultimately, our enemy, the devil, seeks to kill, steal, and to destroy. Right now, even the wife of Joshua Harris, in her Instagram posts, is now celebrating her freedom. She feels that getting out of Christianity has given her freedom to live her life. In truth, the Bible says that people who do not have the Lord are actually slaves to sin. We are slaves to ourselves. True freedom is when you find Christ and find your deepest satisfaction in Him and in Him alone. And the kingdom of God, I tell you, is a kingdom that fulfills. Jesus made a promise to the Samaritan woman that if you drink of this water, you shall never thirst. What did Jesus exactly mean by that? Well, what Jesus meant, first of all, is that if we have Christ in our lives, we would have eternal life. But aside from that, it speaks about the sustaining life of God in us, that whatever we might need in our lives, the great I am will always be there for us. Amen? The great I am will always be there for us to show His love and His goodness and His deliverance. Sometimes our problem is we stop waiting upon the Lord. And the Bible says that those who wait upon the Lord shall mount up with wings like eagles. They will renew their strength. They shall run and they will not be weary. They shall walk and they shall not faint. All we need to do at times is simply wait upon God. And as we faithfully wait upon Him, He displays all of His goodness and faithfulness in our lives. In verse 25, we find that they remembered God's deliverance. They remembered the crisis and they remembered how God delivered them. Look at verse 25, please. It says, But when it came to the king's attention... He commanded by letter that his wicked, the wicked scheme of Haman, which he had devised against the Jews, should return on his own head and that he and his son should be hanged on the gallows. So they remembered how this evil scheme returned on Haman's, ha on Haman's head. Haman and his sons were actually hanged on the gallows. Let me ask you, were there moments in your life when you experienced great injustice or oppression? Were there times when you were trampled upon? Were there times when, when your human dignity 
was, was something that was fiddled upon by certain people. They insulted you. They mocked you. They, they said all sorts of things to you. They were insensitive to your feelings. They were insensitive to your needs. Has it ever happened to you? Has it ever happened that, that somebody has, has actually sought to destroy you and destroy everything that you were working for? Well, it happens. For as long as we're living here on earth, those things are part of the reality menu. But I am so sure that if you stood faithful with God, He remained faithful to you and He delivered you from that oppression and He vindicated you. He brought out poetic justice. And again, that's something you need to remind yourself. In verses 26 to 32, as we move on, we find that Mordecai and Esther made permanent this remembrance of how God delivered them. So let's read verses 26 to 28, please, at this time. It says, Therefore, they call these days Purim after the name Pur, and because of the instructions in this letter, both what they had seen in this regard and what had happened to them. The Jews established and made a custom for themselves and for their descendants and for all those who allied themselves with them so that they would not fail to celebrate these two days according to their regulation and according to their appointed time annually. So these days were to be remembered and celebrated throughout every generation, every family, every province, and every city. And these days of Purim were not to fail among the Jews or their memory fade from their descendants. Now, some of you might wonder why was the feast called Purim? Well, from the Bible Knowledge Commentary, it says, the feast was called Purim because of Haman's use of the pur, the lot, the casting of lots, which was called the pur, to determine the time of the execution. The pur became a symbol of God's using circumstances to deliver His own. That is why it is called the Feast of Purim. And by the way, they celebrated it in two days, not just one day, but two days. And Matthew Henry was quick to point out that there is no such thing as an overdose of celebrating and thanking God. Amen? I mean, you can thank God, in fact, for, for a whole day. The book of Psalms says, seven times a day, I praise the Lord. I mean, we can, we can do that because God has done so many good things in our lives. I mean, just today, the fact that you came here safe and sound is a blessing, amen? You could have met an accident. That could happen, amen? You had food on the table this morning. Isn't that something to thank God for? And now we're, we're given the grand opportunity to worship the Lord, to sing songs, to glorify God. Now we're seated comfortably in our seats and we're listening to the Word of God. God is using me to, to remind you of His goodness and love. Isn't that a good thing? Isn't that something that we should be celebrating? Sometimes the problem is we have taken for granted the good things that God has done for us. But you know what? When, when all these things that we're now enjoying were removed from us, guess what that's going to do? I guess we're going to realize, wow, I just took God for granted. I just took God for granted for, for His protection, for His provision, for His love, for His care, for His concern. You know what I'm feeling right now as I speak this message to you? I just feel the love of God towards you. I just feel His compassion towards you. I, I just feel God in His goodness just, just reminding you that He is a God who is always there for you. And that He will never forsake you. He will never leave you. That is always there standing for you. Working for you. In fact, that's the good thing that I find with our God. Our God is not a capricious God. 
Our God is a God who doesn't act in, in random ways, but He is a God who is very intentional in showing His love and His care for people. I recall this woman who was brought before the Lord Jesus Christ in the temple because she had committed adultery. And the Pharisees and scribes wanted to test him what he was going to do. And they quoted to him what Moses had said that if anyone was caught in adultery, that person should be stoned. And Jesus stooped on the ground and started to write some things on the ground. I don't know what he wrote. But my suspicion, this is just pure speculation on my part, my suspicion was he was writing down the sins of these people who were accusing this woman. And so this is what Jesus said. The one who has not committed any sin, let him be the first to cast the stone. And one by one, all these people left until finally it was, Jesus, it was just Jesus and this woman left alone. And Jesus asked the woman, does no one condemn you? And she says, no one. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Try to imagine yourself in that place. Try to imagine that people around were all already holding stones. And by the way, they were not small stones. When, when Stephen was stoned, they were using boulders, by the way. Try to imagine yourself in that humiliating situation, being publicly humiliated. And there's no hope for you, no one to turn to. Everybody's against you. Everybody wants you dead. But then at that very moment, when all hope is lost, you're left alone with Jesus. And instead of, of fiery, blazing eyes gazing at you, you find very tender and compassionate and loving eyes. I'm sure that woman served the Lord for the rest of her life after that great God moment. Do you remember those days in your life? Now, let me just share to you how the Purim was celebrated all throughout Israel's history, particularly in the early part. It says they always, at the feast, read the whole story over in the synagogue each day and put up three prayers to God, in the first of which they praised God for counting them worthy to attend this divine service. In the second, they thanked Him for the miraculous preservation of their ancestors and the third, they praise Him that they have lived to observe another festival in memory of it. So three things by which they were thanking God for. Later on, it, evol it evolved a little bit, and this is what would happen in their celebration. On both days of the feast, the modern Jews read over the Megillah or the book of Esther in their synagogues. The copy must not be printed, but written on vellum in the form of a roll. And the names of the ten sons of Haman are written on it in a peculiar manner, being ranged, they say, like so many bodies on a gibbet. The reader must pronounce all these names in one breath. Whenever Haman's name is pronounced, they make a terrible noise in the synagogue. Some drum with their feet on the floor, uh, and the boys have mallets, which they knock and make a noise. They prepare themselves for their, for their carnival by a previous fast, which should continue three days in imitation of Esther's, but they have mostly reduced it in one day. You know, when, when I was reading this, I could just imagine how, how joyous these occasions were because one time when we were going to the Temple Mount, uh, there was a, a bar mitzvah celebration, the celebration of the 12th birthday of, of a young Jewish boy or a young Jewish lad. And it's such a joyous celebration. You have a parade and you have the, the young boy right in the middle 
and you have trumpets blowing, you have drums being played, and there's so much singing, and there's so much dancing. It's, it's really a joyful event. It's so Jewish. And I could just imagine how, how joyful this occasion must have been. And, and really, that's how celebration should be done. We should be celebrating the goodness of God with, with, with much joy in our hearts. Sometimes you, you go to a Christian service, it's like somebody just died. It's just like you're attending a funeral service. And that's not how it is. I mean, here's what the Bible says. The kingdom of God is not a matter of eating or drinking, but righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Spirit. Amen? That's what the kingdom of God is all about. Hallelujah. So here's the thing in terms of application. Be intentional in not forgetting those God moments in your life. May I also suggest that the Feast of Purim, which the Jews celebrate, should also be something that we Christians should celebrate. Not just in the sense of what God did for the Jews, but remembering that because of the deliverance of the nation of Israel, Messiah was born, and Messiah died and paid for our sins, was resurrected on the third day, is now seated on the right hand of the Father. The gospel has been preached. Our names are written in the book of life. Amen? What a blessing that is. In verses 29 to 31, it reads, Then Queen Esther, daughter of Abihail, with Mordecai the Jew, wrote with full authority, to confirm this second letter about Purim, he sent letters to all the Jews to the 127 provinces of the kingdom of Ahasuerus, namely words of peace and truth, to establish, that's the key word here, these days of Purim at their appointed times, just as Mordecai the Jew and Queen Esther had established for them. So we find here confirmation letters from Esther and Mordecai. Now, Esther, along with Mordecai, wrote this second letter confirming that the Jews were to celebrate this feast. Unlike Haman's decree, her words, as the Bible says here, were words that gave goodwill and assurance to the vast empire, to the Jews most especially. And it says here in verse 31, and just, listen well, and just as they had established for themselves and, listen well, for their descendants. Recently, we just had our CCM family camp. Maybe some of you don't know what CCM is. CCM means Communion of Christian Ministries. It is a band of ministers that have banded together. We have the same history. We have a shared history because we left our former organization because we felt they were no longer faithful to God's Word. We banded ourselves together not as a denomination, but as a sort of accountability group so that we could watch each other's backs. We could admonish one another. We could check and balance one another. We could even rebuke one another, correct one another, love one another. We do the one anothering. Uh, with each other so that we would remain steadfast and faithful to the Lord. And so the reason why we came up with the family camp was that we were concerned about the next generations. My fellow pastors were concerned about their own children. In fact, in our gathering, some of them actually made the confession that they're not sure that some of their children are actually believers. And it came out actually in the camp. There was one young man who confessed that I'm not a believer. And there was another one who said that he was struggling. All of these things came out in the camp. And the burden of the CCM ministers was that we wanted the faith that we passionately defended to be passed on to our children. And that they themselves would, would carry this baton and not only that, to be able to share it to their own children. That's the burden. Pastor Bob, in his closing remarks, said, 
our show is almost over. He was talking about the fact that many of us are now entering our senior years. Pastor Bobby is 63 years old. Pastor Ricky next year is going to be a senior citizen. Myself, I'm going to be a senior citizen in three years' time. I'm not rushing. I'm enjoying my 50s. But I know it's going to come. And Pastor Bob is right. Our show is almost over. And the big question, of course, is will our children, will our grandchildren own the faith that we have? And we're praying that will happen. And that's why, just to reflect on Psalm 78, verse 5, here's what it says. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should teach them to their children that the generation to come might know even the children yet to be born that they may arise and tell them to their children that they should put here's the here's the here's the intention here's the motive that they should put their confidence in God and not forget the works of God but keep His commandments. So here's the thing. This is not, this thing that we're talking about this morning is not just something for this generation. We're talking about the second generation here. And we're talking about the third generation here. And you and I know what has happened to other countries that were uh, that had great histories of, of mighty revivals, now they're post-Christian. Or now they're entering into a post-Christian period. They're not, there is now a proliferation of those who have become agnostics. There is now a proliferation of people who now consider themselves as atheists. And the number of those who are nominal Christians are abounding by leaps and bounds. The challenges that face us are so difficult and oftentimes overwhelming. But we put our hope and our trust in God. But we, we have to do our part. And what we need to do is to be intentional, not only in remembering God's goodness, but making our children remember the goodness of God. Incidentally, it says in verse 31 that their celebration came with instructions for their times of fasting and their lamentations. So they included times of fasting and lamentation. Why? To remember the painful circumstances. Let me ask you this question. Do you remember your painful moments before God delivered you? Do you remember how desperate you were? Do you remember how dark it was for you? Do you remember it? Now try to remember that. Not that you want to go back to those times. But you know, when you remember those bitter pains that you went through, the memories become sweet. Amen? The memories just become so sweet. And just come out and, and lift your hands to God and say, God, thank you. Thank you for those God moments. Thank you for those times of deliverance. I went through pain. I went through difficulty. But you were always there for me. Sometimes we need to recall our past painful circumstances to reminisce the sweetness of God's deliverance. Finally, in verse 32, it says, The command of Esther established these customs for Purim, and it was written in the book. They were established and written as a permanent institution as it was recorded in the royal archives. As I was looking at this, I was just so thankful to God that I got to write a book, and the second is on the way. And one thing I know with books is that they can live on even when you die. So I'm just so thankful to God that God has given me the opportunity, although I'm really a very hesitant writer, I am just so thankful to God that 
God gave me the opportunity to leave behind a legacy that could be written by some people and hopefully people in the future generations as they read that would be deeply impacted by that book and that they might come and receive Christ as Lord and Savior. So intentionally remembering God's goodness does what? It increases our faith. I wouldn't be here right now preaching to you. I'd probably be like Joshua Harris. I'd probably be, I'd probably be, like, I'd be like his wife who has disengaged herself from anything about Christianity. But what has kept me going on is my constant remembering of the work of God in my life. Let me share to you a sad story of how the Feast of Purim has now degenerated in a manner, in a way that no longer celebrates God's deliverance, but in a manner, in a way that celebrates the flesh. Here's what has happened to that feast. What it has de since degenerated to, according to Matthew Henry, which is much worse, their own writers acknowledge that this feast is commonly celebrated among them with gluttony and drunkenness and excess of riot. Their Talmud says expressly that in the Feast of Purim, a man should drink till he knows not the difference between cursed be Haman and blessed be Mordecai. See what the corrupt and wicked nature of man often brings that to which was first well intended. Here is a religious fe feast turned into a carnival, a perfect revel as wakes are among us. Nothing more purifies the heart and adorns religion than holy joy. Nothing more pollutes the heart and reproaches religion than carnal mirth and sensual pleasure. There's a Latin phrase that goes, corruptio optimi est pessimi, which means what is best becomes when corrupted the worst. Let me say it again. What is best becomes when corrupted the worst. I think that's the story of Joshua Harris. I hope it's not going to be my story nor your story. So be intentional in remembering the goodness of God because this God that we serve, He's a good God. Amen. He is a good God. Amen. Let's bow our heads in prayer at this time. Our Heavenly Father, we just want to thank You and bless You for today. Thank You for ministering to us in a very special way. Thank You, Lord, for allowing me to be a mouthpiece to remind Your people that You love them, that You care for them, that You have great compassion, and that You stand by them through thick and thin, that You are faithful to them no matter what, that You will never desert them, that You will never forsake them. And even though their well runs dry, you're just so willing to quench that thirst. You're just so willing, Lord, to fill them with, with the spiritual hunger that they have. Lord, there is so much about you, and you have so much to give. You never run out, oh Lord. You never run out. Your, your cup is always full, oh God. And your cup always overflows. All we need to do is reach out to you. All we need to do is cry out to you. All we need to do is touch the hem of your garment and we will be healed, O oh God. All we need to do, O oh God, is to behold your sight and we shall see your glory and we shall see your majesty. As we gaze upon you, you will be transfigured before us, Lord, and we will behold your majesty, your royalty, O oh God. How great you are, O oh God, and how blessed we are that we are your children. How blessed we are that, you, that we are your sons and your daughters 
believers, O oh God. How blessed we are that we are part of your kingdom. And in this kingdom, Lord, there is righteousness, there is joy, and there is peace, O oh God, in the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of our God. There is no other name by which we can be saved except the name of Jesus Christ. There is no other name that is greater than your name, O oh God. The blessed name of Jesus we worship you, O oh God. Thank you, O oh Lord. Thank you, O oh God. Oh, Lord. Lord, let not anyone leave this hall unaffected by your word. Be the word, a phrase, or the entire sermon. Let it be that that word, that phrase, that sermon would stick. Let it stick in our hearts, oh God. So that when we get out of this place, we would be refreshed. We would be energized, oh God, to love you, serve you, worship you. Thank you, Lord, for this morning. Thank you that we could also bless you with our tithes, our grace gifts, and our offerings. Lord, use them for the glory of your holy name. And whatever has been achieved today, yours alone is the praise and worship. Amen and amen.